So welcome everybody. My name's Chris and I'm the Salt Lake City Director for the Factory Farming Awareness Coalition. I'm hosting this along with Harriet who I'll introduce here in just a minute. Um, but just really briefly, the Factory Farming Awareness Coalition, we're a nonprofit organization that does educational outreach on the impacts of our food system and food choices, particularly factory farming and industrial animal agriculture. So we're really excited to have Eric here talking about these issues, um, really important topic, especially here in Utah that doesn't get addressed as much as it should. Um, and I don't think people quite understand how large of an impact this issue has. So definitely gonna learn a lot tonight. Um, and I'll go ahead, yeah, I'll pass it to Harriet and she can introduce, talk a little bit more about Thrive and anything else you wanna to introduce to Harriet, so. Okay, thanks, Chris. And I'll be really brief so we can uh, move uh, along to, to Eric. But uh, real briefly, once again, my name is Harriet Emerson, and I'm the group leader for Salt Lake Thrive. Uh, we're in Salt Lake City, and we're a local community group that basically we're dedicated to helping uh, raise awareness of the many benefits of a uh, of plant foods, including for our health and for creating a more compassionate world for millions of animals. And as we'll talk about tonight, he's focusing on tonight. Uh, certainly for our planet uh, as well. So uh, many studies have found that our food choices um, can have global impact uh, to a large degree, but also, um, also there are some local ecological impacts of our whole food system, not just our food uh, choices, but our food system. And so to speak more specifically about that tonight, we're very happy to have Eric Mulvar, he's the executive director of a great nonprofit I was very happy to learn about recently because protecting our public lands is something that's near and dear to my heart and I, at my heart and I expect, uh, suspect many of those folks who are joining us tonight. So Eric's gonna talk about, um, so the Western Watersheds Project, they're all about uh, helping to protect our Western public lands and the wildlife uh, that live on them. So Eric's, Eric's going to be talking about um, how the e focusing on the ecological impacts of having cattle grazing on public lands. So um, really interesting topic that which most people really um, aren't aware of. And so we appreciate having Eric with us. And so after that, then we're going to move along. We have Sharon Bates and Sharon has done many cooking demos uh, for Thrive. And so Sharon is going to do a fun and encourage people to stick around. Uh, a demonstration on mushroom saltado. Did I correct that? Uh, uh, say that correctly, Sharon. And yes. And this yes. Peruvian dish, I'm told, and how it can be delicious and plant-based. So, without further ado, we are going to move. And also, after Eric's uh, discussion, we can have questions and answers. A question and answer period. And hopefully, we can have a very lively, interactive uh, discussion. So, thanks so much to everybody for joining us, and we'll move along to Eric. Well, thanks very much. And I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and get set up here for the slideshow so it can be seen. I think that should do it. So my name is Eric Molvar. And uh, as noted, I am the executive director of Western Watersheds Project, which is a nonprofit conservation group working to protect uh, Western lands and protect and restore wildlife and watersheds uh, all the way from the Rocky Mountains to the Pacific Coast. And uh, we do focus on public lands. And I'm gonna be talking about the environmental problems caused by public lands livestock grazing. And here you see some public lands livestock grazing here in front of you. And uh, you know, those cows are organic and they're free range. So what could be the problem? Uh, isn't that environmentally sustainable? That's what we're gonna be looking into this evening. And just for reference, this is a photograph of what healthy native bunch grass rangelands look like. This is from an ungrazed part of the Idaho National Laboratory, which is where they do experiments on nuclear power. And uh, one of the things that happens on this large federal facility is that they don't allow livestock grazing on about half of it. So you get to see what big sagebrush basins would actually look like if you didn't have cattle and sheep. And this is a photograph of uh, native bunch grasses and what they would, uh, would be like without livestock grazing. And it, because in Western public lands, almost all of them are heavily grazed by livestock and uh, the BLM authorized, the Bureau of Land Management authorizes 50 to 60% of the grasses to be removed every year from their annual production 
Um, so you never get to see anything that looks like this. And people think that the overgrazed condition of public lands is normal, but that's not natural. That's not the natural condition if you had just the native wildlife. And if you look at this slide, this is a, an analysis put together by Public Employees for Environmental Responsibility, which is a group that was formed by Bureau of Land Management employees who kind of got fed up with the problems within their own agency. And what you can see here is the red areas are the livestock grazing leases that are not meeting the uh, land, rangeland health assessment standards. And it's, it's a good 45% uh, or almost half of the Bureau of Land Management lands that are that are grazed by livestock are not meeting the, the standards. And this is data from 2012. And the reason it's so old is that the Bureau of Land Management got tired of being held accountable for the terrible management of livestock grazing on public land. So they started hiding the ball by combining the factors that are the, the lands that are not meeting land health standards, which are with those that are not meeting or moving, but, but moving toward. And what they started doing is they lumped the ones that weren't meeting but moving toward land health standards together with those that were meeting. So it looked like more lands were actually achieving the standards when in fact uh, the improvements hadn't been made at all. So those of you who are in Utah will recognize biological soil crusts and also known as cryptobiotic so soils or bio crusts. These are made up of uh, a, a mix of blue-green algae and lichens and fungi uh, and mosses that, that live in the top layer of the soil and they're really super important in arid lands. Biological soil crust fix nitrogen from the atmosphere into the soil. And of course, nitrogen is the critically important element that is uh, the basis for proteins. So um, if you don't have plant proteins, you don't have anything for the herbivores to survive on. So these, these uh, biological soil crusts are really what hold the, the desert ecosystems together. And you might've seen these types of, um, of signs out on public lands that say, don't bust the crust, don't step on these crusts. And the reason is one human footprint uh, can, can crush and destroy these fragile soil organisms and they might not come back for 30 to 100 years to come back to their full natural state. And of course, it's not just humans that bust the crust. Four-legged beasts bust the crust as well. And so cattle that trample on these biological soil crusts are causing long-lasting damage that, that, that both harms the native vegetation and reduces the productivity of the range for the forage that they themselves eat. So we talked about native bunch grasses and we talked about biological soil crusts. Well, those happen to be the two basic natural defenses that the land has against cheatgrass. And here's a photograph of cheatgrass. This cheatgrass is a non-native invasive weed that came over from Europe in the 1890s and was spread across the West, first by the railroads and then later by cattle and sheep. And it's a, it's a primary colonizer and an invader. And what it does is in disturbed areas which don't have any healthy native vegetation, it can come in on bare soils and take over. And its seedlings outcompete the seedlings of the native bunch grasses, so it quickly uh, kind of swamps the native grasses in areas that are disturbed. And then once it gets uh, established, it burns really rapidly because it's an annual. It dies in June and becomes tinder dry. And what the cattle do is they mow down the perennial bunch grasses. They bust up the biological soil crust. And then you get cheatgrass in the understory of the sagebrush like you see on the right half of this picture. And then once you have the, all that fuel, that fuel then is easily combustible and then it burns. And sagebrush can't survive fires. It doesn't sprout again from its rootstock. So basically once you burn a cheatgrass area that's, that's infested, it turns into a cheatgrass monoculture and all you have at that point is cheatgrass. And that has basically no value for wildlife habitat. And, and it also fuels these huge range fires. And you often hear, hear the Bureau of Land Management and uh, other federal agencies talking about, gee, it's, it's the wildfires that are causing the cheatgrass because an area burns and it becomes a monoculture. But you know what? If you burn cheek, uh, an area that has healthy native bunch grass, you know what you get? This is an area that was burned on the Idaho National Laboratory that had healthy native bunch grass. And what you get is more healthy native bunch grass. You eliminate the sagebrush, but you have native plants once again. 
because these perennial bunch grasses that are native to the West grow back readily after fires. And so cheatgrass is not caused by fire. It's caused by livestock overgrazing. And fire is just the, the switch between a degraded cheatgrass infested sagebrush habitat and, and a cheatgrass monoculture, but the ecological switch between healthy native ecosystems and cheatgrass is the cow. And of course, all of this shift to cheatgrass has a major implication for carbon. And of course, with climate change and uh, solutions to climate change being at the forefront of everybody's mind right now, it's important to think about what are the implications of livestock grazing on carbon? Well, it turns out that desert shrublands are brilliant at sequestering carbon underground with the roots of the sagebrush, the roots of the deep-rooted perennial bunch grasses. There are tons of carbon that are being sequestered all the time underground. Once you overgraze an area, and here's an, here's an example of an overgrazed area, you're destroying the native bunch grasses. All of a sudden, all those roots are dead. They're surrendering their carbon to the atmosphere. You're wiping out the, the sagebrush with the range fires. And then you get cheatgrass, which dies every year and gives up its carbon to the atmosphere. So you're turning in a huge carbon sink under natural conditions into a huge carbon source that hemorrhages carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. You're reversing the climate catastrophe or you're, you're, you're exacerbating the climate catastrophe. Another issue with livestock on public lands is there have been a lot of rangeland treatments. Sometimes they burn off or they disc out the, the sagebrush to get rid of sagebrush because cattle can't eat it so they can have more grass. Another thing that they do is that here you see a, a crested wheatgrass planting. And crested wheatgrass is also a, a non-native weed, but they plant it actively because it's good forage for cows. The problem with crested wheatgrass is it has no value for wildlife. The wildlife hate it. They don't use it for, for habitat. So you're basically converting a native habitat that's rich and biodiverse to a, a habitat that's basically a, 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 an ecological desert. And grasses provide cover for sage grouse and, 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 and livestock is the most widespread human impact to the greater sage grouse, which of course once was found warranted for listing uh, under the Endangered Species Act, remains rare today, populations are still declining. And when you graze down the grass below a seven inch grass height, what you end up with is habitat where these sage grouse can be easily seen by their avian predators and their terrestrial predators. So hawks and eagles, uh, skunks and, and foxes can easily find these normally cryptic and well camouflaged birds and, and wipe them out. And that's why even though most of the sage grouse habitat in the West doesn't have any oil and gas development or other heavy industry, these birds are declining. It's because the livestock are grazing the, the range so heavily that the sage grouse are exposed to their predators. Another big problem with livestock in, on public lands is that, that cows evolved in the boggy, moist northern forests of Europe, and they're not fitted, suited to being out in the desert. And so when you drop cows out in the desert, what do they do? They gravitate right to the water, right to those rich, deep bottom lands, well watered right next to the streams. And these are called riparian areas. Well, these happen to be the biodiversity hotspots of the desert. And when the cattle pile into these, these uh, riparian areas, they wipe out the native vegetation, they ruin the wildlife habitat, they're dumping uh, fecal coliform bacteria into the streams and basically destroying the health of stream systems. Now, this is, a, uh, this is a, an interesting uh, sign that's up in the middle of Idaho that shows how this wonderful livestock management and riparian pasture was used by short duration, uh, high intensity cattle grazing to restore the native uh, ecosystem. And behind this sign, this is what they're achieving. And so this is what they're considering to be uh, the result of this, um, what, what, what is often called the savory grazing system, high intensity, short duration um, rotation. And as you can see, it doesn't work for the native ecosystem. It's destroying these riparian areas. and you know, even the willows along what's left of this streamside habitat are being heavily impacted by cattle. Another thing you get in these riparian areas when they get overgrazed is you get what's called head cutting. 
And basically what happens is you get erosion of the stream channel and the water table drops. So the stream, uh, once, once the roots of the, of, of the riparian grasses get weak, the, the stream cuts downward and, uh, and creates a little canyon. And that means the whole water table is dropping. And that means that whole floodplain has less water available to the aspens, the willows, and the, and the streamside grasses. So it's basically divert, desertifying the whole streamside area. Another thing that livestock do is they get right in the stream channel and they wallow. And instead of getting narrow, deep, cool streams, you get wide, shallow riffles. And so if you like to fish for trout or if you just like to, to know that there are healthy aquatic ecosystems out there with their full complement of native species, basically what the livestock are doing is they're creating habitat that is no longer suitable for cold weather species or cold water species like your trout and salmon. Another issue with livestock grazing and trout and salmon is that these species spawn in gravels and they kind of dig with their bodies and make a nest called a red in the gravel. And then they deposit their eggs and they bury their eggs in the gravel. And what's supposed to happen is the water flows through the gravel and oxygenates the eggs, so it keeps them healthy. But what happens when you have heavy livestock grazing is you get a lot of siltation that comes in from all the erosion from the denuded landscape surrounding the stream and the silt washes into the stream and it smothers and chokes those spawning gravels so that the water no longer flows through and the eggs of the trout and salmon are choked off from their natural supply of oxygen and they die. And this is one of the primary reasons that trout and salmon populations are heavily, heavily impacted by livestock grazing because you have all these cattle concentrating along the stream side, denuding the stream side of its natural vegetation, then rainfall events wash the silt into the stream, choke off the spawning gravels, and you've just cut off your, um, your supply of moisture or your supply of oxygen that, that keeps those eggs alive. Another issue with livestock grazing on public lands is straight up competition with other herbivores. And one cow with a calf is equivalent, eats an equivalent amount of vegetation as two elk or seven mule deer or 10 pronghorn. And so basically you are displacing the native herbivores by taking away their basis of, of vegetation that they need to survive, reproduce and thrive. So, you know, by having more cattle, you're gonna have nest, less native wildlife out there. Another major problem is fences and fences you might think, well, that's a, that's a migration problem uh, for big animals. But also it's a big problem for low-flying sage grouse. And there was a study in uh, Wyoming where they found that 146 sage grouse flew into a barbed wire fence that was only five miles long within a year and a half. Now, if you think that 146 sage grouse can be killed in only a five mile stretch of fence, and then you think how many hundreds of thousands of miles of barbed wire fence have been strung across the West, that's a huge cause of sage grouse mortality. No wonder we've got declining sage grouse populations. And of course, this is also an issue for the large herbivores and the, uh, the antelope in the upper part of the picture, we were able to throw a, a jacket over its head and cut the wire and let it out. But these are migration barriers to pronghorn and elk and mule deer. And all of these species can get entangled in these fences. But for the pronghorn in particular, they don't tend to jump over fences. They tend to, uh, to, to not be able to jump because in pronghorn habitat, there's nothing to jump over. They haven't evolved to jump. So, you know, having these barbed wire fences can be basically a migration barrier. Another issue with livestock on public land is domestic sheep. And here are some sheep from the West Desert of Utah. They carry two diseases, mycoplasma and, uh, and pasturella that that infect native bighorns. And if those native bighorns get these non-native diseases, they're wiped out. They can, one nose to nose contact and it can result in the wiping out of an entire sheep herd. Now the natural uh, big herbivore in much of the West was the bison. But in Yellowstone National Park, bison have caught a, a livestock disease called brucellosis. And now the ranchers want to have all the livestock that exit Yellowstone National Park be slaughtered or hazed back into the park 
so that the brucellosis infected bison don't give the disease back to the cattle. And so this is a collateral impact of livestock grazing. Another collateral impact is the idea of predator control and the livestock industry has an extinction agenda for any wild predator that might possibly eat a calf or a, a lamb or a domestic sheep. And so they, they have an entire um, agency called USDA Wildlife Services that is dedicated in large part to setting out uh, traps and M44 cyanide bombs to do aerial gunning and even to pour gasoline into the dens of coyote pups and burn them alive to get rid of these predators at the behest of the livestock industry. It's basically uh, the livestock industry, even on public lands, wants to tame the wild and achieve their manifest destiny of a domesticated landscape that maximizes the uh, profitability of, of cattle operations. And Wildlife Services goes after all of these different species. And in addition, there are poisoning programs that ranchers are undertaking on their own private lands as well. And county extension services go after these species. So where are these native species going to go to live? if livestock are out on the public lands, and now we need to cl clean off all the species that, that might be inconvenient for the ranches and their profits. In Wyoming, you have the problem of elk feed grounds. And basically the idea here is to lure elk away from their natural winter ranges on private lands. So you don't have elk eating grass on private ranches that might otherwise go into cattle. The problem with this is that in Wyoming right now, you have big chronic wasting disease outbreak, which is another non-native disease. It's a prion like mad cow. And now you're concentrating all these elk on these feed grounds. It's, it's kind of like the opposite of social distancing with coronavirus. It's exactly what you don't want. And WWP right now is suing to try and stop these elk feed grounds before this chronic wasting disease launches into the Yellowstone ecosystem and wipes out the elk populations there. In addition, you've got the conversion of native habitats for hay fields. And it's not just the loss of habitat here we're talking about, it's diverting entire streams and rivers for irrigation for these water hungry crops. And you can end up with rivers that are bone dry and completely lost of their, of their habitat value. Now I wanna show you some, some photographs from Hart Mountain National Wildlife Refuge, which, is, which was closed to livestock grazing in 1992, so you can see what happens when you remove livestock grazing from a degraded ecosystem. So this is back when cattle were there in 1985, same spring in 2013. You can see the difference that, that, that having just the removal of cattle by itself makes. On the left, you see a stream that has been heavily grazed by cattle in 1988. Same photograph in 2013, and this was published in uh, 2015 in a, in a study by Bachelor et al. Here's another riparian uh, wet meadow system that has been heavily burned by cattle, by heavy, heavy cattle grazing. Same thing in 2013 after 30 years of rest or 20 years of rest. This is what it's supposed to look like. Here's a spring area with a little wetland under cattle grazing in 1989 same spot in 2013. And so you can see just by getting rid of the cattle, nature can heal rather quickly. Now this is a photo, this is a slide by the, I think this is by uh, one of the, this is data from the National Cattlemen's Beef Association on where the livestock are being produced. And we have two to three million cattle in Western public lands that, that use that land at some part of the year. But if you look at where the livestock are really being produced in the United States, it's a drop in the bucket. There are about 100 million cattle in the West or, or in the United States as a whole. So the Western public lands are responsible for maybe two to 3% of the annual livestock production. So if we eliminated all of the cattle on Western public lands, and I'm not saying we're capable of doing that, but if we did, it, even for those people who like their, their, their hamburgers and their steaks, it would make a microscopic difference in beef availability and the price of beef. So really, you know, you could lose all of the livestock off the Western public lands and really not make a, a difference that could be felt um, by the American public. So that's all I have. And I'll go ahead and take questions now and, uh, and let folks kind of weigh in and, and, and with their perspectives.
Does anyone have any questions for Eric? You can uh, type your question in the chat box or unmute yourself and whichever you prefer. So I have I have a question and, and forgive me, Eric, if you said so. I know your last slide, you talked about the overall percentage of cattle there in the US are actually grazing on public lands. But are cattle grazing on all the public lands in, in the Western US or are they just kind of everywhere? And I know there's a permit system or what have you, but. It's, it's about overall for all public lands combined about 65% of the public lands are being raised by livestock and being leased for livestock grazing. Now it differs by agency. For the Bureau of Land Management, almost all of their lands are being grazed for cattle. On the Forest Service, uh, only uh, a, 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 a minority of the lands are being grazed because a lot of those lands are heavily timbered and you just can't graze a cow or sheep in that heavy timber. Um, and of course on the Park Service, very few of their lands are being grazed for livestock. So it really varies quite a bit by agency. One of the surprising things is that on national wildlife refuges, they're often leased for livestock grazing, believe it or not. And we have problems, you know, we have, uh, we're, we're, we're in court right now over the Clear Lake National Wildlife Refuge in Northeastern California, where it has one of the last sage grouse populations in California. But those populations are tanking because of heavy livestock grazing and they're limited basically in this Clear Lake National Wildlife Refuge to wildlife refuge lands, which are being heavily degraded. And we can't get the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to cease the livestock grazing. Well, based on what I've learned from various uh, books about this topic, Eric, you know, I believe almost anything about you know land management. It's really unfortunate. We do have a couple of questions from Claudia. She asks, "What are the biggest roadblocks to getting cattle off the public lands?" In your perspective, your view. Well, for you know, to me, it's the uh, unreasonably heavy political influence of the livestock industry. And the livestock industry, if you look at it, uh, you know, take Wyoming. I live in Wyoming, for example, the cowboy state. This is one of the most rural states in the West in terms of human population density. Although if you look at the population density that's living in, city, in, in the city limits, it's actually one of the most urban population uh, centers in, in the country. In Wyoming, there was a study by the, by, by the state of Wyoming's economists that found that Livestock contributed 2% of Wyoming's economy, 2%. But you wouldn't know it if you go to the Wyoming legislature because more than half of the legislatures are active cattle ranchers or sheep ranchers. So they basically control the levers of power at the state government level. And when you look at all the commissions that are appointed by the governor in the state of Wyoming, they're larded up with, with a majority of, of ranchers. And so the political influence is huge even though the population that is, that is actually employed by ranching is minuscule and the economic contribution that ranching has to these Western economies, minuscule. If you look at a state like Utah, it would be much smaller than 2% because you have the Salt Lake Metroplex, which is heavily um, invested in tech, in all kinds of manufacturing and service industries. We don't have any big cities like that in Wyoming and, and, and livestock is only 2% here. But they wield tremendous, tremendous political uh, clout from all the way from county governments all the way up to U.S. Congress. Well, I appreciate that. And uh, it's not certainly just in Wyoming. I recently saw an article, I think yesterday, in Wyoming, and I think primarily at the behest of ranchers, uh, there's a proposed legislation to allow, I think killing, if my math is right, up to like a thousand wolves in Idaho. So very unfortunate. Uh, we have a question from, and I'll let you, Eric, you can uh, respond to this and, and uh, I can if, uh, augment your response if you'd like. Uh, from Ar Arbora, if cattle is the problem, why, are, why is there not more emphasis on moving people towards a plant-based diet? Can we all agree not to eat beef or chicken or pigs at least three days a week? So I, I think she's trying to, he or she is trying, excuse me, is trying to get the supply, the demand side of, of, this, of this issue. Well, it is absolutely true that if nobody ate beef, then there would be no cattle on Western public lands. And if nobody wore wool, then there would be no sheep on Western public lands. 
And so there is a, you know, you could solve the problem by, uh, by converting everybody's eating and consuming habits mm -hmm. in ways that, that basically make these non-economic. And that's one way to look at it. A Western Watersheds Project, we don't um, have an explicit, um, an explicit food-based push other than reduce the amount of beef you eat because we are looking to gain the, as broad a support as possible from people that might be uh, negatively affected for a lot of different reasons by cattle on public lands that might themselves eat beef. And I will take the support from anybody we can get it from uh, in order to get the, you know, the cattle reduced to a level that is at least ecologically sustainable. Now, in terms of, you know, can you have beef on arid Western public lands and be ecologically sustainable? Um, I think you probably can, but the, but the density of, of cattle that you would have to run would have to be so low, it might not be profitable to do that. So um, again, I would say, you know, if everybody in the country would switch over to a diet that was completely plant-based, then, then uh, Western Watersheds Project would no longer need to even exist because the problem would be solved on Western public lands. That's absolutely true. Um, until we get to that day, we're going to be, you know, working as hard as we can to reduce those livestock on public lands from all different kinds of perspectives, embracing all kinds of different, um, you know, kind of reasons that people want to get cattle off. And, and I would point out that, you know, plant-based and, and vegan activists can be very powerful allies in Point Reyes National Seashore, where we're fighting for tule elk and fighting against the, the beef and dairy ranchers. Uh, that are that are kind of clinging to these grazing leases they should have surrendered decades ago after they sold their ranches to make the national seashore. Um, we find that, that that vegan activists are some of our most powerful allies and most most powerful spokespeople among the local population. And of course, the Bay Area of California, you can have uh, you know a much bigger proportion of the population speaking out from that perspective than you might get in Salt Lake City. Mm -hmm. I really appreciate that per your perspective, Eric, from trying to get broad-based support as you can, because it's certainly needed. But I also really appreciate your last comment, because I think that's what we're doing here tonight. I think we're recognizing, you know, this overlap of interests, uh, you know, um, between you know, how the, certainly how the diet you know, impacts our health and our planet and the animals. So I think where we can find that commonality and work together, that's great. And as far as people who choose to, to look at uh, the demand side and making a switch, but well, that's how groups like Salt Lake Thrive provide resources for people who choose to, um, to go down that road. So we have another, uh, let's see, Claudia asked, if we don't reduce the amount of beef we're eating in the US, where would you recommend moving those cattle that are currently grazing on public lands? If we just move them to feedlots, wouldn't that just contribute to different but equally serious environmental threats? So what do we do with those cows? Well, absolutely, feedlots is not a very sustainable uh, kind of uh, model either, because there you're, you know, you're you're plowing out under lands and creating single crop monoculture to grow grain crops that that you know I mean could be dedicated to human food that are then going into cattle. So that's not a great solution either. We would say at Western Watersheds Project, you know, if you're doing your cattle operation, you know, if you have a private ca uh, commercial cattle operation, get your own land and and do it there you know, and do it on private property instead of doing it on public land, then at least the public land could be managed in an ecologically sustainable way for the benefit of the whole public. And you touched on this, this issue earlier as far as the increase in fire because of grazing. Uh, Monica says in the, in the Bay Area, there are a lot of signs that celebrate cows on public land because they are natural firefighters. Fire issues are, are, is a huge issue in California. How would you respond to Eric to someone saying that cows it's a good thing to have cows on public lands because they're natural firefighters. Well, the livestock industry is very fond of that talking point, but the fact of the matter is that even in California, in any of these areas that have a Mediterranean or interior west arid or semi-arid climate, once you have, a, if you have the heavy level of cattle grazing that's required to make a, a measurable difference in fuels from grasses, you need 80% or more consumption of those grasses. That's a recipe for cheatgrass, and cheatgrass is highly flammable. So what you're doing in the long term is you're taking a less uh, a less flammable grassland type, and you're converting it to a much more highly flammable 
uh, invasive weed. And you don't want to do that. So, you know, it really is an illus illusory solution to say that you're going to, to graze things down. Um, and, and that's true for cattle. And, you know, I mean, it's been suggested for wild horses too, that, you know, if you could only ship all the wild horses in captivity and graze down all the grasses in California, you could solve the fire problem, you'd have the same difficulty. You know, overgrazing leads to cheatgrass. Cheatgrass leads to fires on a cycle that can be as often as three to five years. That doesn't move the needle in the right direction. And I'm going to a uh, quick follow-up question for Monica, and then we have a question from Claudia. She says, thank you so much, Eric. She's going to be speaking at the California Coastal Commission meeting tomorrow morning about Point Reyes. What do you think is the most compelling, what do you think uh, would be the most compelling, I guess, information um, to provide to the commissioners? The agricultural runoff or the health of the oceans? Well, you know, I would say uh, the, the most compelling for the Coastal Commission would be the, um, the Yoni's disease that the cattle on Point Reyes carry and the public health hazard that poses and the fecal coliform that also are being dumped into the stream. Every cow has this. Human waste has this fecal coliform bacteria. And that poses a very serious public health risk. And I saw for a moment there, uh, I see we have uh, uh, one of the fellows who, who does water quality monitoring sometimes for WWP, a fellow by the name of Tristan Meek. Hi, Tristan. Um, and and he, what he finds when he's sampling water in Utah is that most of the streams he samples during the time when cattle are out there exceed the Clean Water Act standards for fecal coliform. You always hear the, the old saw, don't drink downstream from the herd. Well, that's because you could die from drinking downstream from the herd and get fecal coliform poisoning. And the California Coastal Commission needs to hear that. And at this point in time, we have one more question from Claudia. I'll let Eric, you take a crack at this first, and then Chris may actually went away on this as well. She asked, where do you see cultured cell-based meat playing a part here? Well, at every, every point in, in, in the supply chain that you subtract the need for live, you know, kind of beef from being raised on public lands, that reduces the demand. And that, you know, so the impossible burger, you know, the, you know, the, you know, kind of cultured meat, all of these things um, allow you to create the taste and feel and experience of eating beef without having the impacts to the land from raising beef or the harm to the animal. If that's, if that's the thing that concerns you most is the animal welfare aspect. Um, you know, so these look like promising ways for humans to get the, the experience of eating beef with fewer of the drawbacks. Now, I am not the one to know all of the different ramifications of scaling that up to the size of the beef economy. So it could well be that the Impossible Burger has impacts of its own or health ramifications. I don't know that. But what I do know is fewer cows that are being raised for slaughter means fewer land health impacts and fewer animal welfare issues. No, I appreciate that. They're often referred to, like Mitch of the Impossible Burger, as stepping stone foods because they do can be helpful to people who are looking to transition and may not, they may not be particularly helpful, but they're certainly, I think you made a good point. They're certainly, uh, you know, it seems at this point they can't be much better for the planet. Chris, do you have anything you'd like to say about that point or? Um, no, I think he covered that pretty well. I mean, we talk about this in our presentations, definitely as one of the one of the options and solutions that are coming up. And yeah, I think um, at least the claims so far made about these products are that they are much better for the environment by greenhouse gas emissions, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, obviously land use and um, all, all the kind of the, the major issues around the cattle industry and producing beef. Um, so yeah, I think, I think they're really, really promising and it's really exciting to see them grow for sure. And, and this has been a great, uh, conversation. We have a couple more questions. We'll, we'll, we'll do one, one more question from Claudia again. Um, let's see, uh, I think it's, it's a question about gra grazing on private versus public land. Basically, ranchers should, uh, Eric said, ranchers should buy their own private land to graze a cattle on, but does not reduce re greenhouse gas emissions or desertification. So basically, there's also wherever cattle are grazing, whether it's on private or public, there's a detrimental 
um, impact. That, that's absolutely true. And, and they're focused on those public lands, but. And we're focusing on, on saving the public lands in the West. And the reason for that is that the private lands that did get homesteaded and go into private ownership, those were the areas, the deepest soil with the most abundant water and, and, and the highest productivity. And yet all of the wildlife hotspots are on the thin soils and arid areas of the, of the public lands. What does that tell you? The public, the private lands are already heavily degraded. And so there's less to save there. And so if you, by shifting the impact to the area that's already brownfields, you are, you know, you are saving the area that has a, an opportunity to thrive ecologically. Um, but the point is real. If you could stop the cattle on the private lands, you know, your, your, your ability, your upside there could be potentially even greater if you could return those to nature. No, but this has been a great conversation and thank you so much, Eric. I'm so glad we're able to partner on this tonight. It's a really important conversation. Um, and, and I hope we can, we can, it was great to meet you. And like I say, once again, I encourage everybody to check out, if you have not already, the Western Watersheds uh, Project. I think they're a small but mighty. It's fair, it's fair to say in a very effective organization. So I've joined and I go on their Facebook page and I sign their petitions, what have you. So I, I, if you haven't heard of these folks, WWP, I highly encourage everybody to, to, to do so. So thank you so much, Eric. And uh, so we are going to,